Well, it is uh, good to be back with you after um, a little break. Um, We found ourselves um, at the end of our trip dodging a hurricane. First hurricane in November in Florida in 40 years, go figure. What are the chances, right? Anyway, always great to be back. I heard last week you were in very good hands with Kurt Erb. Kurt has been our guide through the visioning process and um, I watched his sermon online and it was excellent and it really was a great follow-up to what we are trying to do in our uh, road to renewal. Let's begin today with a prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word, your word which is powerful, which guides us, and your word which changes us if we allow it to speak to our hearts. May it speak in that way today to each of our hearts, O God, as we open ourselves to the message you have for us through Christ our Lord. Amen. Advice. We all know what it's like to receive advice. And we we seek advice from many different corners uh, of our world, many different areas. We seek medical advice. We seek financial advice. We seek relational advice. And of course, often we go on the internet to find advice, although you have to be careful that the sites are reputable. We also seek advice from professionals like doctors, lawyers, accountants, therapists. Advice is defined as guidance which leads to future prudent action. That's a pretty good definition of advice, I think. Guidance that leads to prudent future action. So all of us know what it's like to seek advice and to give advice. The humorist Irma Bombeck once said this, when your mother asks you if you want a piece of advice, it's merely a formality. It doesn't matter whether you say yes or no, you're going to get it anyway. That's so true, isn't it? The English writer G.K. Chesterton was once asked what the secret of his success was in life as a writer. He said, tongue-in-cheek, the secret of my success is this. I listen to advice from lots of different people, and then I do the exact opposite of what they say. I don't know, maybe Chesterton was onto something there. Today's New Testament lesson, which Ken read for us, is a story about advice. Actually, some good advice. It takes place in the days of the early church. The apostles are preaching the message of Jesus faithfully in the temple in Jerusalem, and they are arrested by the authorities because they have run afoul of the laws. They were forbidden to preach in Jesus' name, and so the authorities throw them into prison. But an angel of the Lord comes along and unlocks the jail doors and releases them, and they're free. The next day, they're back in the temple, preaching again. Only this time, they're once again arrested, but they're in deeper trouble because the high priest becomes involved. And he brings them up before the Jewish Sanhedrin, the religious council of the day. And he forbids them again to preach in the name of Jesus. And Peter, in a great act of civil disobedience and courage, says, we must obey God rather than human authority. Well, the disciples are certainly in a pickle because some on the council want to beat them. Others want them put to death. But then there's a voice that comes to their defense from a very unusual source, from the council itself. This man named Gamaliel, he gets up and he says to the council, men of Israel, we have seen many religious movements come and go over the decades and centuries. 
We've seen many would-be messiahs rise and fall. All of them have come to naught. So here is my advice to you. Leave these men alone. If their movement is not of God, it will fail anyway. But if it is of God, you will not be able to stop it. You might even find yourself opposing God. And so the council take his advice to heart. And they, um, after flogging the disciples, they release them. Well, who exactly was this Gamaliel? He's an interesting character. He was a, a very well-respected rabbi and teacher in first century Israel, but he was also the grandson of the great Rabbi Hillel, one of the most revered teachers in all of Judaism over the centuries. And Gamaliel was a teacher of the Apostle Paul back when he was known as Saul of Tarsus. Paul even makes reference to Gamaliel. Later in the book of Acts, Paul is on trial and he has to give a defense before King Agrippa. And he mentions that you can't be more Jewish than I am. I was taught at the feet of the great Gamaliel. And of course, Agrippa is the king who, after Paul's great defense, he says, you almost persuade me to become a Christian, but not quite. So Gamaliel is the one who literally saves the day and actually saves the lives of these apostles by speaking up in their defense. Now, I love how this passage ends. It ends with this verse where it talks about how the disciples did not cease to preach the gospel of Jesus in the temple courts and in their homes day and night. They did not cease. They were faithful. Even in the midst of persecution, they were faithful until the end. Some years back, Don and I were on a, a trip to Italy, and I remember we visited the famous ancient city of Pompeii. Some of you perhaps have been there. Pompeii was that city destroyed by an eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD. And the city apparently was buried for 1,700 years before archaeologists discovered it. And what they discovered was quite fascinating. There were many, many artifacts perfectly preserved in the volcanic ash, and you can still see them there. They also found human bodies perfectly preserved, one of which was a Roman soldier still standing at attention, holding his spear. Apparently, when people were running in fear and terror from the volcanic ash and the spewing lava, this soldier stayed true right till the very end. Well, that guard, I think, was a model of faithfulness, of duty, of service. And the apostles themselves faced a lot of adversity in the early days of the church. But they remained faithful in preaching about Jesus. Now, we are told that they were brought up before the council with these charges. And Peter offers a very succinct defense. He offers kind of a mini-sermon of only 50 words in the Greek. And it's a very simple message. Here's what he says. God raised up Jesus after you crucified him. He is now exalted on God's right hand as Savior so that he may give repentance to Israel. And we are all witnesses to these things. Now, it's not the first time the Apostle Peter faced criticism in the book of Acts. A little later in Acts chapter 11, the, the Jewish council is upset that he has taken the gospel to the Gentiles, to non-Jews. And Peter again makes a defense about how God and the message of Christ is for everyone. At that time, he said, if God sent the same Holy Spirit to the Gentiles, who am I to hinder God? God. 
Peter wanted no stumbling blocks for people when they came to know Christ. Everyone was welcome, regardless of their background. And Gamaliel's words are similar in a way. He reminds the council to be careful. Don't find yourself on the wrong side of history. You might be hindering God. Now, sometimes I wonder about Gamaliel. I kind of wonder, did he come to faith at one point? Did, did he ever become a Christian? We don't really know. But he's one of a number of people throughout the Gospels who seemed very close to the kingdom of God. Joseph of Arimathea, the secret disciple that followed Jesus. Or the story of the rich young ruler who was so close to being in the kingdom and in the end just couldn't divest himself of everything that was getting in the way of his relationship with God. And even King Agrippa, the same King Agrippa where Paul mentions Gamaliel, he was the one who said, Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian, but not quite. He couldn't take that final leap of faith, and neither could some of these others. Well, today's scripture presents us with some different responses to the message of Jesus in the early days of the church. And each response corresponds to a significant character in the story. Front and center, of course, are the religious authorities of the day, the Sanhedrin or the Jewish Council of Elders. They arrest the apostles and bring them before the council. Verse 27, when they had brought them, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are determined to bring this man's blood upon us. Well, these disciples were witnesses for Jesus, but their message was not considered to be benign in the eyes of this council. They were not just telling people that Jesus loves everyone. No, it was something deeper. It was something almost subversive. They were proclaiming Jesus to be the Messiah, and he demanded worship and allegiance. Now, the apostles were first arrested for healing in the name of Jesus and drawing public attention. But then they went on to proclaim this message of the one who was executed on the cross by the Romans. And he upset the leaders because of his concepts about the Messiah. And he was also contrary to Caesar. The high priest tried to put out what seemed like a small fire but only ended up stoking a much larger one. He thought he had done away with Jesus. Jesus was crucified and buried, but now it was like a match to the straw. Three days of calm, and then Jesus was raised again. In Acts 4, the high priest was amazed at the courage of Peter and John. Luke writes, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been companions of Jesus. The disciples were now empowered by the Holy Spirit, and the fire of faith that was ignited could not be put out by any of the religious leaders or political leaders. Next, we have Peter and the apostles taking center stage in this narrative. Peter has a bold and courageous response for the council. Verse 29, he says, We must obey God rather than any human authority. I actually like how the old King James Version puts this verse. In the King James Version, Peter says, We ought to obey God. We ought to obey God. It's actually from an old form of English, the word ought, which actually meant, oh, 
If one ought to do something, then one owed something. We owe our very lives to God, so we ought to pay him with service. We ought to do this because we owe him. And the early disciples emphasized this idea, and they were willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. Early in the second century, a Christian was arrested and brought before Pliny the Younger, the Roman governor of Asia Minor. And Pliny could find no crime in the man other than being a Christian. And at that point, Christianity was part of a forbidden and outlawed religion. So he was kind of bewildered by these Christians who didn't seem to be intimidated by worldly threats. So he decided to really threaten this Christian that was standing before him. I'll banish you, he said. You cannot, came the reply of the Christian, for all the world is my father's house. Well, then I'll slay you, said Pliny. You cannot, was the reply, for my life is hid with Christ in God. Then I will take away all your possessions. No, you cannot, for my treasure is in heaven. Then Pliny said, well, I will drive you away from humanity, and you will have no friend left. And once more, the calm reply came, You cannot, for I have an unseen friend from whom you cannot separate me. Throughout history, the words of Peter echo in our ears. We must obey God rather than human authority. This confession is a reminder that at the end of the day, the power of God is greater and more steadfast than anything we can offer. God's authority is the first and the last word. This God who became flesh in Jesus, who rose from the grave, who empowered his people with his spirit. The main theme of the book of Acts is the unhindered spirit of God. It is about a gospel message that cannot be controlled by human power. Then the most unique response in this narrative comes from the character of Gamaliel. Verse 38, So in the present case I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone, because if this plan or this undertaking is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may even be found fighting against God. In Acts chapter 11, Peter was defending his work with the Gentiles before the Jewish leaders because they didn't at first want to admit non-Jewish people into the Christian faith. And Peter's response was similar to that of Gamaliel. Who was I to hinder the work of God? The apostles couldn't have predicted how God was going to deliver them in today's passage. There was no way to know that this man was on that council. But God knew. God first delivered the disciples through supernatural means as that angel unlocked the doors of the prison. But now God used an enemy to release them. You see, God is sovereign over all the events of history. He can even use opposition in order to assist us. Gamaliel, I must say, was a very wise leader. Sometimes great truths are wrapped up in unorthodox methods, in ways we are not familiar with. But if we wait and we are patient, we may discover that God is in the midst of them. God often uses unlikely people and circumstances to restrain the forces of evil. Down through the centuries, one of the greatest truths about the church is that it has survived and that it has not been stopped. Stopped. 
This truth can be seen in the famous Oberammergau play. Some of you may have been to Oberammergau. Every 10 years since 1634, this small Bavarian village puts on this huge passion play. And it began as a vow by those villagers back in the 17th century. If God spared them from the terrible black plague, they would reenact the passion of Jesus on a regular basis. Well, the village was saved. And that play has been performed for over 400 years. But unlike the 17th century versions of the play, the play actually now has a diversity of religious belief. Catholics, Protestants, Muslims, even agnostics take part in this great play. And the play has continued to offer the greatest story ever told and a reminder of how God is in the midst of his church in the world. Friends, throughout the centuries, the church of Jesus Christ has survived. It has survived because God is still at work, just as he is still at work here in Kingsway in this particular iteration of the church. And as imperfect a vessel as the church is, it is God's means of spreading the gospel message. I love the words of that old hymn. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. And then one of the verses later in that hymn, Though with a scornful wonder we see her sore oppressed, By schisms rent asunder, by heresies distressed, Yet saints their watch are keeping, Their cry goes up how long, And soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. Let us pray. O oh God, throughout the centuries, the church has faced adversity, persecution, and difficulty. And we face our own challenges in this generation. Help us to stand strong like Peter and those apostles of old, to obey you rather than any human authority that may run counter to your word. Help us to be people of grace and love toward others. May they see Christ in each of us. But when the day of adversity and hardship arrives, help us to stay strong, knowing that you are always on our side, O God. May we always walk in the footsteps of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.